Carbohydrate molecules, so individual monosaccharides, can be modified in a variety of different ways by our cells. Now, generally speaking, why would our cells want to modify sugar molecules? Well, by modifying sugar molecules, the cells can actually change and alter the properties and the functionalities of sugar molecules, and this is crucial in many different processes that take place inside our body. And one very important process in which we modify sugar molecules is in the process of glucose metabolism, as we'll see briefly in just a moment. So there are two modifications of sugars that we're going to focus on in this lecture. We're going to begin by discussing phosphorylation of sugars, and then we're going to move on to glycosidation of sugars. So whenever our cells actually uptake sugar molecules, the first step in the breakdown of glucose in glucose metabolism is to phosphorylate glucose. It's to basically transform the glucose into glucose 6-phosphate. So on the reactant side, we have the beta anomer of the cyclic form of glucose. So we have carbon 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, and this is the anomeric carbon, and it's the beta anomer because the hydroxyl group on carbon 1 points in the same direction as this group attached to carbon number 5. So in the process of phosphorylation, when we transform glucose into glucose 6-phosphate, we essentially add the phosphoryl group onto carbon number 6 as shown in this diagram. Now, what's the major difference between the glucose and the glucose 6-phosphate? Well, the major difference is the presence of this modified group, and this group contains a net negative charge, specifically a charge of negative 2. So, compared to this glucose molecule, which has a net charge of 0, this molecule has a net negative charge. And whenever a system in nature contains charge, what that means is its energy is higher, it's less stable, and it's more reactive. So essentially, by phosphorylating a glucose molecule and transforming it into glucose 6-phosphate, our cells increase the reactivity of the glucose molecule, and that allows it to basically undergo further processes and ultimately break down and form the ATP energy molecules that our cells use as the major energy source. Now, the second reason why we phosphorylate glucose molecules is to increase the polarity of the glucose molecule. So, compared to this unmodified glucose, the phosphorylated glucose contains a higher charge, and so it is more polar. And because this molecule is more polar, it is much less likely to actually spontaneously leave the cell. Why? Well, because around the cell, we have the cell membrane, which consists predominantly of nonpolar lipid molecules. And so, this highly polar glucose 6-phosphate cannot spontaneously leave the cell because it cannot pass across the nonpolar bilayer membrane surrounding the cell. So, once again, the first step in glucose metabolism involves modifying the glucose by adding a phosphoryl group onto carbon number 6. Now, phosphorylation of glucose gives it a net negative charge and transforms it into an anion, and this is done for two reasons. The first reason is to prevent the glucose from spontaneously exiting the cell, and the second reason is to basically increase its energy, make it less stable, more reactive so that it can form more linkages and can actually break down and form those ATP molecules. Now, let's move on to the process of glycosidation. And before we actually examine what that is, let's begin once again with this same beta anomer of glucose. So, we essentially have the beta D-glucose molecule in its cyclic form. Now, even though the cyclic form is more stable and it's going to predominate at equilibrium, we're still going to form a very tiny amount, less than 1% of the open chain of this D-glucose molecule. And in the open chain, we see that we have the aldehyde. Now, what's the big deal about the aldehyde group? Well, from organic chemistry, we know that when an aldehyde group is in the presence of some type of oxidizing agent, for example, a copper ion with a charge of positive 2, 
that will basically undergo an oxidation reduction reaction. So this will basically act as the reducing agent and the C2, the oxidizing agent, while well, that will act as the oxidizing agent. And what we'll have is, we'll form a carboxylic acid. So the thing about this unmodified D-glucose molecule is that it contains an aldehyde group when the glucose exists in its open chain form. And the aldehyde group is reactive when in the presence of oxidizing agents. And when that happens, when we'll have some type of oxidizing agent in the presence of the unmodified glucose in its open chain form, we'll transform that glucose into a carboxylic acid. And such sugar molecules, unmodified sugar molecules, that can basically react with oxidizing agents to form the carboxylic acids, these are known as reducing sugars because they act as reducing agents. Now, under certain circumstances, our cells don't actually want this reaction to take place. And what our cells do is, they essentially remove that aldehyde group by reacting it in a process we call glycosidation, which basically transforms that glucose molecule into a glycoside. So what happens is, we can basically undergo the process in the presence of alcohol. So let's suppose we have the simplest alcohol, methanol. Now under acidic conditions, for example, in the presence of some type of acid, let's say HCl, so hydrochloric acid, what will happen is the hydrochloric acid will basically protonate this hydroxyl group. This will basically depart forming a carbocation intermediate. And then this can act as a nucleophile attacking this carbon either from the top side or bottom side and ultimately we form a mixture of these two molecules, these two products, and these two products are known as glycosides. So this is the methyl beta D -gluco, uh, uh, peronicide, and this is the methyl alpha D -gluco peronicide. And notice the difference between these two molecules is simply the orientation, the stereochemistry of this group attached to carbon number one. In the beta case, this points in the same direction as this group. In the alpha case, it points in the opposite direction of this group here. So these two products are anomers. We have the alpha and the beta anomer, and they're called glycosides. Now, this bond shown in red, the bond between the anomeric carbon number one on that glucose molecule and this oxygen that is part of this uh, methanol is known as the O-glycosidic bond. We call it the O-glycosidic bond to basically differentiate from the N-glycosidic bond that we'll talk about in just a moment. So the O simply means the bond is between carbon and oxygen and not between carbon and nitrogen as the case is in the N-glycosidic bond. Now, what's the entire point of carrying out this reaction? Why do our cells actually want to create these glycosides? Well, by creating the glycosides, we essentially remove the hydroxyl group and we basically take, the, uh, we remove the hydroxyl group and we replace it with this uh, group that came from that methanol alcohol. And by replacing it with this group, we essentially remove the presence of an aldehyde from the open chain form. And if there is no aldehyde presence in the open chain form, then that means when either of these glycosides are in the presence of oxidizing agents, for example, the cupric acid that we spoke of earlier, the, C, the Cu2+, the copper ion with the 2 plus charge, these will not react in the presence of oxidizing agents and they will not play the role of being the reducing sugars because in the open chain form, they do not contain the aldehyde group. And so these are known as non-reducing sugars because they will not act as reducing agents in the presence of an <coughs> oxidizing agent. So 
unlike the unmodified D-glucose, as we spoke about just a moment ago, the glucose glycoside does not react in the presence of oxidizing agents. And this is because it cannot be converted into an open chain form with an aldehyde group and such unreactive sugars are known as non-reducing sugars. So inside our cells, under certain cases, we want to keep the glucose in its unmodified form because we want to be able to react glucose in some way to basically form a bond. But under certain circumstances, we want to be able to transform glucose into a glycoside to prevent it from actually reacting with other types of reactive oxidizing agents. Now, another way that we, uh, that we can transform the glucose into a glycoside is by reacting with amines. And we actually spoke about this type of reaction when we discussed DNA and RNA molecules. So when a ribose molecule or a deoxyribose molecule, in the case of DNA molecules, react with some type of nitrogenous base, which is actually an amine, we form a nucleoside. So this is what we call a glycosidation with amines reaction. So the anomeric carbon of D-glucose, so carbon number one, can react in the presence of amines to form not an O-glycosidic bond, but the N-glycosidic bond, because in this case, the bond is between the carbon number one and a nitrogen atom. So if we take, for instance, this same glucose molecule that we spoke of earlier, the beta d glucopyranose and we react it in the presence of some type of amine, we basically replace the hydroxyl group with the amine group. And so now this bond in red is known as the N-glycosidic bond. And we'll see many examples of these types of reactions in the lectures to come. So the major point of this lecture is the fact that sugars can be modified in a variety of different ways. And by modifying the sugar molecules, our cells can actually control the properties and the reactivities of these sugar molecules.